Excellent. So thank you everybody for coming at this kind of year that's really hard to get people to make time in their schedules yeah. um, with the term just having ended and undergraduates have left, faculty are, and yeah. probably even some grad students are marking, marking, and, um, and Friday at 4 p.m., which is yeah. <laughs> yeah. But we do, I'm glad we have a, a good hearty set of audience members for this. So this yeah. is actually, <laughs> Um, you may not have seen in the advertising, but this is a joint effort of the um, Comparative Canadian Colloquium, or Comparative Canadian Workshop, and the IR International Relations Colloquium in the department to organize um, hosting our speaker today, who is Professor Volodymyr Dubovic yeah. from Nechnikov National University right. in Odessa. Yeah. Um, uh, hasn't been there for a while, yes, so he's, that's right. um, he's been in a number of places over the past year or so. Um, so he is from the Department of International Relations and the Center for International Studies at his home university yes. in Ukraine, uh, but has done research fellowships at a number of places, the Kennan Institute, Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars a few different times. Um, also the Center for International and Security Studies at the University of Maryland and the University of Washington yeah. nearby, where he's, yeah. he's headed there in a couple of days. Yeah. Uh, he's been a Fulbright Scholar twice and um, currently is um, at Tufts University at the Fletcher School on um, a Scholars at Risk fellowship for, right. for the current time yeah. um, and has received over this crazy past yeah. um, just over a year no. grants from the Kennan Institute and non-resident yeah. fellowships from George Washington University and the University of Toronto. Yes. Um, so he his expertise is highly in demand right now because he works on some of the problems related to yeah. the current war yeah. and, and Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. So yeah. he's a co-author of Ukraine and European Se Security from back in 1999 sure. and has published quite a number of articles on U.S.-Ukraine relations, regional and international security, and Ukraine's foreign policy. Um, so I'm really excited to hear what he has to tell us about how he sees yeah. the current state of affairs. Right. Um, so what does Russia's war on Ukraine teach us so far, is what he's called the talk for today. So yeah. he'll talk for however long you want, yeah. around 40, 45 Great. minutes, Sounds and good. then we'll yeah. have a nice discussion. Sure, afterwards. thank you, Lisa. So, so first of all, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I mean, I really appreciate it. I understand the timing is not perfect, and it's not ideal, but that's uh, how it is. It's very much an impromptu kind of uh, little tour for me in this region, in this area. And I'm really uh, grateful to Lisa and Catherine and Jeff and everyone on your team for putting this all together. Uh, indeed, uh, I've never been here in this part of Canada before. Uh, you know, so I'm going to be here in Vancouver, then I go to University of Victoria, from where I go to Seattle, where I actually spent half a year teaching back 10 years ago in 2013. So, so I'm familiar with the region, but on the American side of the border. And uh, here in Canada, actually, I, uh, I was an exchange student at one point of time. That was in 1990-91 on a different coast in Nova Scotia at the Acadia University. So at that point of time, when I came in, uh, you know, it was still a Soviet Union, you know. So, so when I left Canada in 91, it was still Soviet Union. I actually came back five days prior to the August coup of 1991. For those of you familiar with Soviet, late Soviet history, you know, and people were wondering, like, why did I come back? You know, <laughs> you know don't you see there's a coup? You know, like, you know, and I said, okay, well, but the coup was short lived only for two or three days. So, yeah, and both Vancouver and British Columbia are heard so much before, and that's a, that's a wonderful opportunity for me to visit, of course. So, and uh, yeah, life's are, life is still difficult in Ukraine, as you know, uh, things are not normal. Uh, just as Lisa was uh, sh uh, sharing some bio details about me, I looked up there in the sky and I saw an airplane. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's a normal situation. You look in the sky and there's an airplane, but not for Ukraine, not for Ukrainian. So actually, I was just, this thought went quickly through my mind that uh, one of the first things that Ukrainians see when they get out of Ukraine now 
they immediately perplexed, but like, oh my God, there are planes flying in the sky, actually. So that was the same case with me when I left Ukraine after spending uh, half a year in Western Ukraine as an internally displaced person. So when I went to Warsaw, to Poland, to, to finally to get my American visa and come to teach at Tufts, University of Fletcher School of Law Diplomacy at Tufts, you know, one of the first impressions, like, they actually have airplanes flying. So that's, that was interesting. So I left just a little bit, I mean, for you to understand uh, where I came from in the last uh, year, year and a half, maybe I left uh, Odessa, my hometown, two weeks prior to the start of massive invasion, because I was sensing that something was going to happen. Uh, I can say that I was among those few experts in Ukraine who actually anticipated the large scale invasion to happen. I didn't, I wasn't sure what was going to happen, but I thought that maybe it's quite possible, it's quite feasible, quite, you know, photomable for me, that they might strike at Odessa. So even if it's not a large scale invasion, even if maybe like a minor incursion or something like that, they might go straight to Odessa, you know, with, with combined effort by land troops, uh, amphibious landing or something like that. So therefore, I didn't want to be there, you know, because Odessa is such, situated in such a place where it can actually be easily cut away from the rest of Ukraine or encircled or besieged, and, you know. And uh, I think it was validated over time because in many places where Russian troops came into Ukraine, they already had a list of people uh, who are pro-Ukrainian, pro-Western, pro-NATO, pro-US, you know, critical of Russia. You know, I would be in that list. So if they would come to Odessa, luckily enough, they never came to Odessa. They actually stopped well short near, near Mikulayev, you know, so north east of Odessa. But you never knew. So that's why I moved out to Western Ukraine in the Beef region and where I spent half a year, you know, with, uh, you know, being an internally displaced person. And, and also when I got an invitation from Tufts to come and teach as a visiting professor, as a scholar at Brisk, uh, I also struggled a little bit because, as you probably know, there's martial law. So. Some men like me are not meant to leave, you know. So currently it's still the case that university professors are exempted from mobilization, but at the same time we're not allowed to leave. So so I struggled a little bit, you know, getting all the experiments and papers in place. <laughs> and I even got late uh, to uh, two times four months, so I came uh, like in early October last year, instead of being there by the time their school year starts. But so they arranged like a half course, half term, semester, half term, uh, course on the Black Sea Regional Security for me, which I taught in the fall. And I just finished this last Monday. Uh, I just finished the course, uh, ended the course on Ukraine security and foreign policy there as well. In the meantime, I've been teaching for my Ukrainian students. So all the time, ever since the massive invasion started online, you know, so we actually had a hiatus, uh, you know, a break, a pause in classes for like two weeks after February 24th last year. And then we decided we're going to go on. So, so we've been doing that ever since. So exams, you know, what have you, you know, graduation papers, presentations and stuff and classes. And I have two courses in the fall, two courses in the, in the spring. So I'm doing one right now, <laughs> you know, so it's going to be interesting because actually uh, I, that would require me to get up early in the morning here on this coast to do my classes for, <laughs> for Ukrainian students. Yeah, so that's a little bit about myself. So in addition to what, uh, you know, Lisa mentioned, because of course what Lisa mentioned is what you have in the bio, which is very formal, right? So this guy just went to here and there, you know, and got some kind of fellowships. But I wanted to establish, you know, this atmosphere here in this room so you would understand where I'm coming from. And of course, in that particular respect, I'm by far not in the worst situation ever since the war started, because you actually had millions of people who had it much harder than I did, obviously. So. Not to mention, I mean, come on, I have some people, close colleagues in Mariupol, for instance, you know, who were actually in Mariupol University there, including their president. We've been involved in a number of projects with them, so they barely survived, they barely made out. So, I mean, of course, I've been in a much better situation, but I wanted to you to give a human side of it, you know, <laughs> some kind of personal side of the situation with me, uh, as one of those Ukrainians who have been traumatized by this war, even though I've never been under the bombs or missiles strikes but I'm clearly traumatized. But uh, let's get to the topic of uh, talk. Uh, so what did we learn, actually? What uh, does, uh, so far, the Russia's invasion on Ukraine teaches us? What does it teach us? So, I mean, one thing is, uh, is a little bit difficult for us to assess in this particular respect is that the war is not over, right? So a lot of people, a lot of times, say, with a great validity, I recognize the validity of that uh, argument, that 
we probably can't even say fully what are the implications, what are the results, because we don't know what the end game is. And the war is very much ongoing, you know, so there is no signs of it uh, stopping or ending anytime soon. You know, there is this understanding that at least for a number of months, both sides, Ukraine and Russia, are going to continue and try and fight it off. You know, and therefore try and get to a better negotiation position, maybe, for the future, for that day when they would have to sit down and actually decide what happens next. You know, that day might may come or may not come. This could be actually a perpetual war. You know, I don't think in this audience I need to remind you that this war is not year long, but it's nine plus years long since 2014. So, so basically, we can easily go back to the like lower level of. In, you know, hostility and intensity of the conflict like we had for eight years in Donbass prior to February last year. So, or it could be frozen or, you know, kind of frozen, you know, half frozen, like for this eight years uh, in Donbass, it's never been actually frozen, but a lot of people outside of Ukraine and the world, you know, they saw it as a, as a basically frozen conflict. So, you know, some skirmishes along the front line, the contact line, but those skirmishes actually took away lives of 13,000 people, you know, in, in all this eight years but that's of course nothing you know comparison to what happened in last year so what we did learn we learned a lot of things about ukraine you know we learned a lot of things about russia we learned a lot of things about the entire region the post-soviet eurasia the eastern europe the Black Sea region uh we learned some things maybe about um, you know european integration space your atlantic space uh we learned things about international order you know we learned things about uh you know how much democracy or values or certain principles, the moral, uh, you know, kind of uh, foundations matter or not in today's world's foreign policy and reaction to the Russia's war in Ukraine. So we learned a lot of things. I'm going to talk through this uh, uh, about Ukraine. I mean, one thing, of course, about my home country, we have learned that Ukraine is not a failed state. You know, that's one thing. Uh, all of, you know, that's kind of in your eye <laughs> when you look at the performance of Ukraine. Uh, so we are in a difficult state in a dire straits, you know, so very difficult situation, obviously. But uh, far from being a failed state. And uh, that is already coming as a surprise uh, for a lot of people, you know, earlier in the war, in the first several weeks, you know, people were expecting for Ukraine maybe to crumble like a house of cards, maybe to unravel. You know, I remember clearly that discussion that we had in our field between the August of 1990, uh, not, not 1990, but August 2021 and February of 2022. So what happened in August 2021, American troops were withdrawn from Afghanistan. And then people had this discussion. So is Ukraine going to be this next Afghanistan? So if Russia strikes, you know, that what's going to happen to Ukraine? It's going it's to just unravel and crumble like Afghanistan did. So in the first days of the war, definitely the first weeks of the war, we found out that the answer is no. You know, by far, you know, it's quite a different situation. And we were arguing that Ukraine is different, uh, even prior to February, you know. So in case Russian invasion happens, we're not going to be like in other Afghanistan in many respects. Uh, so uh, the major difference is, of course, that we fought back. You know, Afghani army, Afghanistan army didn't, you know, Americans invested tons of money into Afghanistan army and security service, and they just didn't fight, you know. So, so they, you know, the entire force that Americans trained in Afghanistan was also like something like 300,000 people. So that's, that's vastly outnumbering the number of Talibs, you know, but they just didn't fight, you know. And of course, the leadership, you know, the leadership matters after all, you know. And uh, President Ghani, Ashraf Ghani, he jumped on the plane and left. President Zelensky said, no, I'm staying, you know. And the government stayed and parliament stayed, you know. And there were a few cases here and there when we're now wondering how some of the members of parliament maybe how they ended up abroad maybe and how they then returned and why they went abroad early in the war but that those were like very few rare cases so mostly people just stayed and that was extremely important i mean early in the war especially you know the leadership of zelensky you know like he was appearing on on the tv every, every day you know every evening and calming down ukrainians and rallying them around the flag that was extremely important you know and he became our wartime leader, so that was a very important moment. I mean, I'm not a big fan, never voted for him, was very suspicious and very critical of him, you know, skeptical of him becoming president. You know, um, I was probably belonging to those who said, like, if, God forbid, the big war starts, then Zelensky is not the person for the moment, you know. But then, well, you know what, he's not doing that bad, you know, definitely in terms of being the excellent communicator, you know, and in terms of lobbying for Ukraine, in terms of going around, 
you know, and maybe sensing the audience really well be, because of being a professional actor and knowing how to deliver the message, you know, in the way that, uh, you know, your interlocutor would actually find it difficult to say no to what he's asking for. So I guess in that respect, that was really interesting. So, so not a failed state, you know, basically actually better running government, even better governments, uh, good governance really comparing to, I only have jokingly mentioned that. I think our government works better than before February 24th. So maybe because of this heightened responsibility on, on the people, like because people actually in the country depend on you and they expect you to deliver. And, you know, people just kind of mobilize, you know, quotation marks, even if they don't go to the front lines, you know, that includes people working in ministries and agencies in Kiev. You know, the train's running on time. You know, recently the guy who was running Ukrainian railways, uh, Mr. Commission, he went to another ministry. But uh, he was a, like a rock star, you know. First of all, he would deliver all these foreign leaders coming to Kiev and Zelensky leaving from Ukraine to other outside, you know, foreign visits. And some people on Twitter were wondering, like, can uh, Amtrak get him for a while, maybe to fix Amtrak, <laughs> you know, but that's just one case, you know, and that's, that's true, you know, like, um, uh, trains were almost never delayed, you know, you, you would hear like, okay, yes, there is a missile strike, oh, okay, maybe some switch signs or signals uh, being destroyed by Russian missiles, so the certain train, like, delayed, like, by hour or something, like, <laughs> And evacuation trains, it's a massive operation, of course. You, 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 you actually transported millions of people, you know, quickly, you know, because, of course, with evacuation in Ukraine, that's not only the numbers which are unique of people who became IDPs and refugees, but the, 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 the timing, you know, the window within which all of that was accomplished. So, you know, the failed state couldn't do it, you know. It, it takes a government and leadership on one hand, and it takes a civil society the people who are actually vibrant, you know, patriotic, organized, you know, on the other hand. And together they're working. So that's another thing. Actually, we basically have this togetherness in Ukraine still. Uh, you know, civil so society with the government kind of tight, which is kind of unique in the case of Ukraine, because actually we're often in this kind of a mood before this massive war where we're in this kind of uh, format of talking about them and us, government and the rest of society. You know, and basically critical of our government all the time. But right now, no. I mean, a lot of people recognize, well, maybe Zelensky is not perfect. Maybe he made mistakes before the war, during the war, you know, something like that. But uh, we need to call less. We need to actually rally and consolidate. And that's what you're seeing in Ukraine. So you've learned about Ukraine that we can fight back, that our military is much better than everyone expected. Uh, you know, that our militaries may be better because they actually, many of them went through fighting in Donbass different scale of fighting, but still people gained experience through Donbass, because on Ukrainian side you actually have rotation of units through Donbass over eight years. On the Russian side you didn't. So you basically, whatever Russian military personnel was involved in Donbass, they were mostly the same kind of people all the time. So it was a very limited number of people who actually had uh, experience of fighting in Donbass. So basically the Russian army didn't have any experience of that similar type of fighting that they're doing in Ukraine the last year, ever. You know, because the Syria is different, Chechnya, Maybe similar, but that was also a long time ago, you know, so many of those people retired now who fought in Chechnya at one point of time. On Ukrainian side, you actually had people who went through Donbass and people who've been trained by a lot of missions, you know, including the mission by this country, you know, uh, you know, which was actually in place for a long time, but also Americans, Brits and others, you know, and uh, also we can attribute a lot of things like how Ukrainian military units were fighting creatively in a tactical manner, very, very smart manner you know, trying to outsmart much bigger, larger enemy force, you know, to that training, you know, you can actually uh, make a connection between how they were trained and how they fought back. So, yeah, and in general, you know, the volunteers are back, you know, we're funding, we're sending money to whoever needs it, uh, to the units in the front line, they need a new car, okay, fine, we do crowdsource, you know, that's not and that's definitely not the country which is like one of the richest countries in Europe. It's on the contrary, one of the poorest countries in Europe, now even poorer because of the war. You know, a lot of people lost their businesses and everything, their jobs, but people still do that. So, you know, once again, we learned a lot of things about Ukraine. It makes me proud to be Ukrainian and uh, belonging to that collective entity called Ukrainians. And uh, uh, going forward, I think it's going to be a strength. Uh, if the war is over, when it's over, hopefully, you know, in terms of recovery and rebuilding, in terms of maybe getting our act together, in terms of doing reforms and cleansing the country of corruption, I think there will be, there will be some positive momentum 
and imp impact and impulse coming from this war in terms of Ukrainian Ukrainians uh, applying more pressure on the government to actually do the right thing, you know, in including on these issues of reforms and corruption. So on uh, on the Russians, of course, we learned a lot of things as well. Uh, well, uh, you know, ultimately, of course, very arrogant. Uh, you know, uh, underestimate our underestimating Ukraine, overestimating their own uh, you know possibilities and, and capabilities rather. Uh, and uh, you know, but then not quitting. That we found out as well. You know, because a lot of people thought that after this uh, complete failure of an uh, early stage of invasion, that maybe they would back down. They didn't. In fact, they doubled down. You know, that's in the nature of Putin. So, uh, so that's what you have. And of course, going forward, uh, Putin is still thinking that he can outweigh everyone. He can employ some kind of strategic patience, uh, simply because it still remains an asymmetric conflict in many respects. Because Russia is just a bigger country, population-wise. So, in terms of mobilizing reserves for the army, they can do more than Ukraine. They have natural resources unlimited. Uh, they sell tons of stuff at the international markets, actually. So they have the money to fund the war, basically indefinitely. You know, the sanctions, unfortunately, are not working to such an extent that, you know, that we would expect them to stop the invasion because of the sanctions. So, and in terms of ideology, I uh, see them, unfortunately, actually, you know, some people are not believing what Putin is saying. Some people left the country not to fight in the war. But a lot of people are staying. And a lot of people are actually going to the war, even like volunteering to fight in the war, you know, because they believe the narrative that they are provided from the Kremlin. So, so that's unfortunate. I think we have actually have some consolidation there too, and sort of resilience, at least persistence, you know, in terms of uh, staying power, in terms of finishing the job. And Putin is clearly not the guy who is willing, who is ever considering to, to quit or lose or be humiliated. So, so therefore, uh, thinking about the future scenarios for this war, of course, we should be aware of this case that uh, Putin might actually use whatever it is in his hands. Uh, you know, uh, what he can use uh, to actually not to lose this war fully. So, uh, about the region, uh, what we learned, of course, that this war is uh, going to change the post-Soviet Eurasian space for sure. Uh, a lot of things are happening. I mean, Russia is there as an aggressive country, you know, so everyone knows what they're capable of right now. You know, it's out of discussion now. You know, a lot of things that people said, oh, it's just not going not gonna to happen because it's just such a terrible, you know, it's not feasible, you know, it's not going to happen. No, <laughs> well, the worst things in the world happening now, the war crimes and everything, so we know what they're capable of, so that's changing uh, uh, reaction and, and perception of Russia in the region uh, from in every point of the region, really, you know. So, for instance, in Belarus, you know, let's take Belarus, it's basically non-existing. Uh, entity now politically as uh, so not a sovereign country anymore, you know, so basically Russia runs things there. Lukashenko is trying to maybe not to allow Belarus being dragged into the war even deeper than it was already, but still, you know, basically Russian troops are based there and everything. So, so uh, if Ukraine prevails in this war, Russia loses. That gives a chance for Belarus in the future to truly become a, a democratic, you know, sovereign country, to get rid of Sokoshenko one day and have free and fair elections, and slowly but surely maybe go on the right track. So if Russia prevails, somehow Ukraine loses, and that's, that's a very vague definition, I understand that. You know, we can go into that in details later if you want to, uh, because there are so many shades of what you mean by victory or, lo or loss or lo lose, losing. Uh, so. Uh, but uh, if he is Russia prevailing, you know, Lukashenko is based in there for, you know, as a governor of that region of Russia or president of Belarus, but there for life. So and maybe then gives power to someone else like his son or something. So we'll see. Uh, Moldova, next door to my hometown of Odessa, for instance. You know, I actually been to Moldova just a few weeks ago with a tough study trip. We had a tough study trip of students and faculty members uh, to Moldova and Turkey, two interesting places to be there these days. Moldova was basically saved by Ukrainian resistance. You know, we talked to a lot of people in Chisinau and they all acknowledged and admitted to us that they were terrified by what was going on and they packed their suitcases and were sitting on suitcases in the first several weeks of the war, basically being ready to quickly go into Romania if Russian troops show up here. Uh, the expectation was that they would show up, they would probably take under control Transnistria. That was easy to expect, but they might not stop there. And they actually might just, you know, completely incorporate the rest of Moldova as well. 
So people were terrified, therefore. And now uh, what you have, you have Ukrainians stopping Russian troops, people are relaxing, you know, and working with Ukraine on so many occasions and so many levels, you know, like in energy field and other fields and working with the West. And uh, in recent weeks and months, actually, we learned that Russia is still trying to destabilize Moldova, specifically the government and the president, uh, Maya Sandu. Uh, but the West is now paying attention. That's good. You know, so a lot of countries, you know, European Union, United States actually pay attention. They provide assistance. They give projects, uh, various things. Like, like I said, energy is a, is a painful, delicate issue there. So they're trying to help on that, on that account but also even like on the Secret Service Corporation, for instance, like helping uh, special services of Mold over Moldova to deal better with provocateurs and Russian agents and so on. So, uh, and therefore, like in the South Caucasus, for instance, you know, that's, you have some implications there. Some you would probably expect them to be the case, some you didn't. Uh, for instance, Azerbaijan being more, even more emboldened with what they can do in their major, you know, kind of imperative priority for them is to deal with Armenia and actually uh, return all those uh, territories that they consider theirs. Uh, and now, you know, even previously before the massive war against Ukraine, Russia kind of distanced from defending Armenia, as you know, uh, but now even more so, you know, even if they're willing to actually help Armenia with vis a vis Azerbaijan, they kind of can't, can't because they're actually using all of their resources, all of their energy, all their time on Ukraine. Their, their plate is full, you know, so therefore, you know, it's, it's interesting what Azerbaijan is doing, how they're emboldened by, by their recent successes in the recent several years in this war against Armenia, how they're supported by Turkey, Turkey, and, and what, what is happening to Armenia too, you know, in terms of Armenians now understanding that they don't have a Russian support behind their backs necessarily, so what that would mean for Armenia, what that would mean for, the, for them under, trying to understand what's going on around them. Like, okay, if not the Russian support, what do we have, you know, in this difficult part of the war that we find ourselves in? You know, can we actually negotiate more, you know, maybe with Azerbaijan, you know, can we actually maybe uh, try and ask Americans and others in the EU basically coming back into the region and, and try again, you know, to, with some kind of a peace settlement mission uh, and other things. So, uh, in, in Georgia, it's a different situation there, you know, you basically have a complete gap between the, the society, which is still very much for Ukrainian, and the government, which is, which is doing really strange things, you know, but uh, a lot of people who are observers of Georgia over years, they're not surprised necessarily. They say that the Georgian government was kind of going in that direction for a while now. So, you know, undemocratic, basically applying pressure on opposition, you know, putting people like Sarkashvili in jail, you know, and I'm not gonna not gonna go into details like even if he deserves it or not. But you know, uh, and uh, you know, basically trying not to poke Russia even now. You know, when Russia is weakened, obviously dramatically weakened, and there are voices in Georgia who say, actually, why don't we try and use this momentum to actually liberate our lands taken by Russia one point of time, which is South Ossetia and Abkhazia. But uh, that's not a government position, of course. The government position, on the contrary, is let's actually normalize with Russia. You know, the, the suggestion that they should restored the flights, direct flights to Moscow, I mean to Russia from Georgia and vice versa. Uh, and of course, the recent suggestion of adoption of that law, uh, uh, you know, on foreign agents, which is completely copying Russian law and, and the manifestation and, and the protest and, 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 and uh, the protest in the Georgian society that led, uh, you know, to actually them, you know, scrambling and doing away with that law for, uh, for now. Uh, and of course, uh, I mean, in terms of Ukraine Georgia relations, we've been together all the time. We've been a duo, we've been tandem, we've been working on the EU front, on working towards NATO and so on, coordinating our activities, getting into the visa free regime with Schengen, with the EU, basically at the same time, Georgia is a little earlier than us. So there's been so much cooperation going on for years, and now we're kind of feel like we're backstabbed by the Georgian government. And that's not, it doesn't mean that Ukraine was expecting some kind of massive assistance. You know, you can't, you know, Georgia is, after all, is, is very much poor itself. They don't have much of military forces or arms arsenal or, I don't know, the financial resources to give any assistance to Ukraine, meaningful assistance in this much, in this large scale invasion to fight us, to fight Russian invasion back. But at least rhetorically, we were expecting more of it, but when it's not forthcoming. So that's very much a, a shame, you know, which is actually name of the movement that Georgian civil society launched, uh, uh, movement of shame, they call it, you know, of shame of our government not supporting Ukraine, you know, because of course, when Georgia was attacked in 2008, 
you know, Ukrainian president back then, Mr. Yushchenko, he jumped on the plane right away, and he came with president of Poland and Baltic countries, and he spoke at the you know central square, and, you know, supported the Georgians. They remember that, you know. But now, when Ukraine needs help, you know, and most of Georgian society says, yeah, let's help Ukraine what, with what we can. That's that's not happening. So that's interesting, you know. So in some cases. You actually have Russia retreating and pro-Russian forces retreating in post-Soviet space. In some, you actually have them advancing, like in the case of Georgia, in, in, in a way, uh, because they are emulating the, 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 the form and the mode of governing like there is in Russia and more and more in Georgia, and that's unfortunate. In Central Asia even, you know, and I'm not a big expert on Central Asia, but to look at what happened like last year, you know, like all those meetings at the Shanghai Cooperation Agreement and, and other, and the CSTO, uh, you know, the, the, the Security Cooperation Treaty Organization, uh, you know, how these leaders who were actually usually the clients of Russia, how they talk to Putin, you know, in, in this, in what tonality, you know, they were demanding respect, they were actually chastising him, they were criticizing him, like, what are you doing, you know, and he was, you know, a short video there, uh, you can see, he's puzzled, he's really like not understanding what's going on. Mm -hmm. This kind of people would usually come to me asking for some assistance and everything, and right now they're kind of talking to me in this critical voice and everything. So that's even there, you know, you kind of see them emboldened by, you know, Russia not achieving its goals in Ukraine, being weakened, you know, and being not as strong as a lot of people thought around the post-Soviet space. So that's another thing. I think wherever you look in the post-Soviet Eurasia, you already have some implications, even though the war is not over. All right, and many people were sitting on the fence. And many people were trying to see, you know, not to, not, not to speak on the subject even and try to see what, what happens at the end. You know, because if Russia prevails, they might be sorry for whatever anti-Russian, you know, stance or steps they might take. All right, or Russia loses, you know, on the contrary, they might think, you know, that, uh, you know, that they've lost the moment uh, to move to the right side of history. So, and um, uh, even wider, of course, uh, that was, uh, you know, outside of post-Soviet Eurasia in, uh, in, uh, in the Black Sea region, everyone is terrified by the war, obviously, because, uh, you know, it's really affecting the region. Uh, you know, from back in 2014, obviously, uh, when Crimea was taken by Russia, but now even more so, there was uh, actual, uh, you know, heated exchange of fire missiles flying and everything. You know, in the north western part of the Black Sea, situation is clearly not normal, which is affecting the entire Black Sea. So with trade, of course, you're aware that there was a blockade uh, between February and, uh, uh, you know, July of... Uh, uh, of uh, 2022. Actually, the blockade was established even prior to February 24th. A lot of people didn't, didn't notice, but Russian uh, you know, battleships were there even prior to the start of massive invasion and already were blocking Ukrainian ports, including Odessa. So that was a big deal. And then the Grain Deal, of course, signed on July 22nd. And then the next day, actually, Russian missiles flying into Odessa port. So Russia is always, you know, in, in the typical for them manner. You know, with one hand, they're kind of signing a good agreement, a grain deal, okay, and benevolent country willing to, you know, to do something because it's common sense, you know, okay, so yeah, let's do this. On the other hand, you know, basically sending missiles to destroy certain facilities, you know, that support actually very close to those that are involved in grain trade and everything. So, uh, in the Black Sea region, uh, there is Turkey, of course, which is balancing, uh, well, not necessarily a new thing for Turkey, they've been doing this for years. Uh, their balancing act got even more sophisticated since February last year. Uh, so they are working with Turkey, with Ukraine. They're working with Russia as well. They're both to both, talking to both sides. They've been trying to mediate. Uh, you know, last last year in the March of last year, there was an attempt of mediation, and Ukrainian and Russian delegations met in Turkey. And of course, the Grain Deal, which I've just mentioned, also was mediated uh, and put in place with Turkish participation. Uh, so therefore, there is a reason to believe that maybe if there is a moment comes when Ukrainians and Russians would like to sit down and talk uh, to each other about how this war ends, that Turkey would probably play a role. There are not too many countries uh, otherwise who can play such a role, who are positioned well for this because they actually have open channel of dialogue with both Moscow and Kyiv. Um, another country which tried early on actually in this massive war uh, to do something similar but quickly quitted was Israel actually. The Prime Minister Naftali Bennett came in into Moscow earlier in the conflict, and, uh, but he understood that, oh, well, no, no, no. I mean, there's it's no, it's no point to talk about anything like peace or resolution or settlement because it's going to be a war for a while. So this, this current new old government of Netanyahu is a different, interesting situation, you know, actually. So you, you, can, you can even see implications coming all the way into the 
greater Middle East, if you like. So because for Netanyahu, uh, for Israel in general, you know, like they are very careful not to irritate Russia. They really depend on what Russia does in Syria, you know. But at the same time, they are also seeing, and that's emerging as one of the major factors for them to look at into in this situation into deepening Russian-Iranian cooperation. So, and they are not necessarily liking what they see. You know, it's not only Iranians giving something to Russia, but Russians are giving stuff to Iranians. You know, and Iran, of course, is clearly the major threat to them, you know, existential threat to Israelis. And therefore, you know, when the Iranian drones, Shahids, were delivered to, or Shahids, you know, were delivered to, to, to Russia, uh, the rumors had it that the next day, Israeli military personnel was on the ground in Ukraine, teaching Ukrainian air defense people how, what to do with those drones and how to better, you know, shut them down, shoot them down and what, you know, what's the weak points of those drones that you can use and so on. Uh, and now there is also the anti, uh, there is a ra radar system against missiles that Israelis actually just tested just a few days ago, uh, first time in Ukraine, including in Kyiv, which allows Ukraine to better understand where the missiles are flying into, because uh, usually with Ukraine, it, it takes only one Russian strategic bomber to be uh, in the air, and then but basically the entire country, half of the country is under the air raid alert, because we don't know where, where they're going to strike. With this new Israeli system, it's more sophisticated, it's early warning, they, they allow Ukrainians to see better, like which particular area is actually under threat and which is not. So in some areas you don't allow, you, know, you don't announce air raid alert, which is a big deal. People go around their business and go to school and stuff. And some do you do. And then people in those areas where you do, they actually need to go quickly to the shelter. So that is interesting what's going on with the entire Eastern European flank, you know, what you often call maybe the Baltic Black Sea, security zone, space. Uh, they are clearly, they are very nervous about what's going on, you know, I mean, can we be next if Russia does Ukraine, you know, if Russia overwhelms Ukraine, uh, you know, so therefore they're really rooting for Ukraine, uh, unsurprisingly, so of course for a lot of countries in Eastern Europe, it's, uh, it's a matter of not just values, you know, them seeing what Russia is doing, so they're outraged, so they think, okay, we need to support Ukraine, but it's also of course a matter of their own interests, uh, because they understand they will be under threat. And whoever says right now that Putin is not planning to do anything against, say, Estonia, Latvia, or Romania, you know, think again. You know, so many things in recent 15 years that people said, no, never going to happen. Starting from August 2008, when people said Russia would never send troops into Georgia except for South City and Abkhazia, and they did. And then people said, no, but that they, would, they wouldn't do it to Ukraine. Ukraine is too big. It has an army. It's a, you know, brotherly nation uh, to Russia. But they did in 2014. They took away Crimea. They messed with Donbass. So, and then again, people said, okay, those are very tactical, small kind of regional moves, but to imagine the massive large scale invasion of Russia into Ukraine, completely impossible. And then it's happening already for a year plus. So, I mean, therefore, I think only this logic, you know, I mean, is this really a scholarly approach or not? No, <laughs> you know, can we be sure that Russia is going to strike someone if they do Ukraine? No, but, but I guess the logic and the common sense of this conversation in that respect is like they might. You know, they'll be emboldened. They'll be weakened on one hand by Ukrainian resistance, but they'll be also emboldened if they actually achieve something in Ukraine. They would say, okay, let's probably do something else. Let's not forget that, uh, you know, like their security suggestions or articles or demands, whatever it was in, back in December 2021, it included what? It included basically undoing half of NATO enlargement back to the, you know, borders of, you know, of 1996. Uh, uh, so they, they actually spoke about it, you know, that they are interested under certain circumstances of getting, about getting the Eastern Europe under some kind of, kind of their control. So therefore, of course, everyone like in the Baltic republics, in Poland, many other places, you know, they are really terrified. Uh, and uh, that's why they support Ukraine. And that's why, in a way, I do agree when people say that the focus and the heartbeat of European security and European institution even in European institutions has moved to Eastern Europe, Central Eastern Europe now. So you would usually expect to hear and see what Berlin does, Paris does. Now people very much look at what Vilnius does or Warsaw does. So it's a very interesting phenomenon. I don't know it's going to be like a long term. No, I don't know it's going to be a trend. Uh, it's, it's too early to say. Maybe it's just a situational moment, you know, a situation thing. You know, maybe just go away because after all, if you look at the you know, the weight uh, 
uh, you know, of you know, Germany and France, you know, financially, politically, within European space, it's different, it's bigger. But, you know, it's, it might be a beginning of some kind of a shift. Uh, and by the way, with NATO, I'm not going to even talk much about NATO because, of course, it's a wake up moment for them. You know, 2014 was in a way, but 2022 for sure. You know, they're basically back to their understanding of what the alliance was there for, it's created in 1949, and what it was for 40, uh, 40 years uh, later. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, so, so it's basically the same threat, more kind of recognizable threat, a little different maybe. You know, you're not, but you're preparing to fight it, you know, and the strategic concept has been basically rewritten. Uh, you know that both the strategic concept for NATO was basically ready by the time Russia started this massive invasion, but then they delayed, uh, you know, a publishing and issuing that uh, strategy. Same thing, actually, by the way, in the United States, both the national strategy, uh, security strategy, national defense strategy, and even nuclear posture review, they were all delayed because they were trying to, to work into it what's happening in russia ukraine war so so people's thinking is kind of changing and of course the troops are being sent to eastern flank not just americans you know french doing it others doing it you know between 2014 2022 it was mostly like part-time patrol air patrols and stuff like that rotation forces coming in and leaving now people are actually talking about you know about, about permanent base being basement uh, basing of those troops uh, western european american and those countries uh, the NATO Russia treaty uh, at one point of time, you know, it's not going to be really valid anymore. So people say, okay, whatever we promised to Russia when the NATO enlargement was going on, it's irrelevant right now. It's in the past. You know, it's really obsolete. So, so we really need to be able to defend those countries. You know, because of course with Estonia, Latvia, and others, uh, you know, by the time you actually kick into the play, into the force, the Article Five mechanism half of that country or entire of the country can be taken by Russian troops. So that's not that's not good enough. Okay. So they're changing their thinking about this and that's about that's about NATO. So and of course NATO can still advance and NATO can still invite Ukraine one day. You know, not necessarily what I think is gonna be uh happening anytime soon. My personal understanding is that it's not gonna happen, but there will be deepening cooperation between NATO and Ukraine. It is as we speak already very deep right now with the amount of money being given to Ukraine and weapons and training and everything. So it's unprecedented. I mean, basically, Ukraine is de facto member without the guarantees, without the Article 5. So would that be deepened or developed that kind of format going forward? I don't know. The summit is coming up in July in Vilnius, uh, Ukrainian side, the president, of course, demanding, OK, tell us when you're going to invite us, you know, maybe do it even like now. I don't think uh, many countries would. Some countries would probably support this idea, some wouldn't. So the last thing actually we want in Ukraine uh, for NATO to be divided deeply on this issue. So for now it's actually working really well because a lot of countries within NATO are giving what they can to Ukraine to defend ourselves. So that's uh, that's a kind of a uh, situation that we would like to continue, right? So we don't want them to to actually fight between each other and quarrel uh, because Ukraine would be demanding in dramatic terms. Uh, you know, Zelensky would be talking all the time about give us membership now, give us membership now. With the European Union, by the way, also quite a revolutionary situation in many ways. I mean, by the way, leading to, you know, Rolf person in history, as we say, as uh, Vladimir Lenin used to say, <laughs> one of his famous expressions. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen is really a very formidable leader. You know, that's clearly the case now. And even uh, Jose Borrell, <laughs> High Commissioner of Foreign Policy, who was really ridiculed often, um, now he's kind of coming across as decisive at least rhetorically and so on. But look at what the European Union did, you know, I mean, I mean, provide putting sanctions in place. I mean, they're not working. OK, you know, so not harsh enough, maybe not tight enough. OK, maybe not enforced enough. Maybe there are some loopholes that you still need to to deal with. But I think eight or more, whatever the packages they were there uh, supporting Ukraine. You know, I mean, of course, with hosting refugees, giving financial assistance to Ukraine and even giving money to Ukraine to buy weapons. Think about, it, you know, whoever among us, whatever we knew about the European Union for many years, you know, that's is the typical soft power kind of actor. You know, you need reforms, we'll give you assistance. Okay, you need something like that, we'll give you some assistance. But to give money to the country outside of the European Union, you know, to buy weapons, to actually fight against another country outside of the European Union, completely unthinkable. Now it's going, now it's happening. It's not, a, and that's not a lot of money. I think it's about four billion euros or so. 
So it's really dwarfed uh, in comparison to what Americans, for instance, giving, and others giving, and this country, by the way, is giving a lot uh, on many occasions. But it's really a lot. And also cutting the dependence of Russian gas and, and, and oil. You know, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. I mean, I, going forward, I think, I'm sure, that Russia is going to regret that. You know, if they lose European market, it's going to be a big deal. Whatever Russians are saying now out loud that, oh, we don't really need it. We have Asia around the corner. We can sell whatever we need to Asia. We can compensate for the loss, loss uh, of European market. That's, of course, a lot of you know, BS because they actually do need a lot for their economy to sell stuff to European, uh, to European consumers. So therefore, if European Europe is detaching, deblocking itself, unblocking itself from, from, from Russia and depending on the Russian energy supply, that's going to be a big deal. And they, and they achieved a lot within the months, you know, and they survived that winter, which Russia was really hoping would break the spine and coherence of that pro-Ukrainian coalition. And finally, I mean, the United States, you know, I mean, you have United States, uh, which is, was, as President Biden said, we're coming back, but people were wondering, are you really coming back and for how long? You know, and what do you actually mean by coming back? You know, we had four years of Trump, okay? Even now, people are worried in Europe, like, it could be another four years of Trump, and you never know. So, but um, if people had this question, like, uh, is American leadership possible? And is American leadership needed? In the last year, actually a year and a half, I would say, uh, we, we got the answer, you know, and, and the answer on both questions is yes. Because, of course, first of all, it's, it's, it's possible, you know, especially if you work with allies, and if you can do that, and Biden administration does it. And uh, so people were wondering, like, oh, maybe America is not a superpower anymore. Of course, it's not uh, Pax Americana anymore. It's not a hegemony. It's not this unipolar moment that they maybe enjoyed for a few years in the early 1990s. Uh, but uh, so people were wondering, like, can, what, what America can actually do, you know, with their resources and potential. Now we see what they can do. And the leadership, too, is very much needed. So if not for the leadership of Biden administration, I, I don't think there will be such a viable, strong and robust pro-Ukrainian coalition of countries, which includes dozens of countries. There's the Ukraine Defense Contact Group, for instance, which meets like about once a month, and uh, they decide what to send to Ukraine, what kind of weapons and so on. U.S. is playing the central role. And of course, we should remember that the U.S. we've been playing this role from like at least end of October, so the fall of 2021, when they understood that Russia is probably planning this massive aggression. So we need to put the plans in place. You know, it's another thing, it's a discussion which is happening in in our field and uh, among Americans themselves, the experts, the politicians, like maybe it was a mistake for Biden administration not to do preemptive sanctions against Russia, not to give Ukraine more weapons on a larger scale in the months coming up to February to prevent Russia, to preempt Russia from striking. Uh, so that's an open discussion. We never know. We know what the logic there was in Washington. Like we don't want to provoke Russia. Maybe they're not planning the massive invasion. Maybe it's just an intimidation campaign. Uh, against Ukraine, just blackmailing Ukraine, you know, so it, it must have looked like preparation for invasion to be a successful intimidation. So I remember those weeks, many weeks before February 24th, I was sitting in several roundtables uh, online every day and people were wondering and guessing and no one knew the answer, of course. So, so that's how it was. And uh, uh, now we know the answer. And now, of course, it's very much helpful that Americans actually thought about sanctions, worked with Europeans, uh, you know, uh, they basically you know, planned what kind of routes will be used to deliver weapons to Ukraine. So all of that happened very quickly on the day one when the Russian invasion started. Okay, all of those mechanisms were prepared, put in place, which was a big deal for Ukraine. And even early in the war, you know, when we didn't have so many sophisticated weapons in Ukraine, whatever we had, you know, javelins and other things and other anti-tank, uh, you know, rifles or what's the right word, not rifle, obviously launchers, you know, given by Britain and others, they were very much in demand. So, of course, when the Russian troops were stuck outside of Kiev for various reasons, uh, and um, tactical with Zhao Ukrainian small units were attacking them and taking away, taking those tanks out of order, you know, for, for Russians, uh, there was a big deal, you know, so they probably saved Kiev and Chernihiv, you know, earlier in the war, you know, because Russians didn't expect any resistance, and they got quite a lot of resistance. So. Okay, uh, so going forward, of course, final considerations there. Uh, it's an interesting discussion that we have why the West should actually do what it does to help Ukraine. You know, and uh, one, some people say, well, first of all, it's about international order. It's been broken, violated by Russia in the most violent, you know, blatant, blunt way. 
So everything that you can do to violate the international order, international law, Russia has been doing to Ukraine. So, so that's good enough for us to act and support Ukraine and punish Russia if we can. You know, other people would just basically look at it and say, we want to support the underdog <laughs> in this fight. Russia is a big predator here. Ukraine is a smaller country defending itself. So let's support Ukraine. Yet uh, others would say it's really about ideology as well. So it's democracy against authoritarianism. And actually that's a widespread view in a lot of countries, and including US, where President Biden has been speaking, speaking a lot about you know, democracies coalescing against authoritarian countries. So there you go. You have this direct conflict and the war between one authoritarian, major authoritarian country and democratic country of Ukraine, which is democratic, obviously. It's probably messy. It's probably sometimes imperfect democracy, but it's clearly democracy. You know, proving with two Maidans, with rotation of powers, with vibrant civil society, with free media, to criticizing government and so on. So there are so many elements that you can, uh, that allow us to call Ukraine a clearly a democracy. So therefore, if you believe in this, and this kind of rationale, you know, you need to support Ukraine. And finally, the interests. I mean, for Eastern Europeans, it's clear. You know, for more distant countries like US and Canada, it's less clear because the war is, after all, across the ocean, with signs of miles away. But, but I think uh, the interests are involved as well. If Russia prevails, there's clearly, you know, a domination of a hostile country and a Western country in the post-Soviet space and this great Eurasian space. If you like the political approach, you know, remember Mackinder uh, speaking, Howard Mackinder speaking about the heartland and Eurasian island. If you're not, you know, still, I don't think it's going to be a welcomed development if Russia dominates over this entire post-Soviet Eurasian space and uh, leaning over Eastern Europe, Central Eastern Europe, Southeastern Europe, and so on. So uh, I think the interest involved as well, as well. You know, final consideration may be some organizations that are not necessarily uh, encouraging their, their performance. You know, United Nations, well, we've heard some criticism about it for a long time. But the very fact that Russia is presiding, you know, now in Security Council, the country which is waging this genocidal war against Ukraine, is basically sitting there and presiding like nothing happens. It's quite a shame. You know, but uh, well, we know it's routine, it's procedures, it's system, it's rules. We're just following the rules and so on. But uh, uh, at least UN was kind of being involved in the grain deal as well, which was a big deal. That's why Guterres actually flew several times to Ukraine and Turkey, and you know, so he was betting a lot on this deal, basically trying to show that UN is not completely futile. You know, it's not completely useless. <laughs> so it's actually doing something. You know, and of course, uh, United Nations organizations like UNESCO, UNICEF and others helping Ukraine, you know, and others. So the OCE, I mean, that's that's exactly, I don't know, is it is it the last coffin, as we say, last nail in the coffin? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, what, what is that? What is it? What is it for? You know, what, what it can do? <laughs> if you have a, if we have a conflict in Europe of that size and that scale and this dramatism and so many victims and the OCE is nowhere to be seen, you know, what is, what is it for then? So Ukraine is wondering. <laughs> You know, maybe nothing, you know, maybe you can just ignore it. Maybe you just, it, you know, maybe just dismiss it, you know. So it's another conversation we can have. Like, do, are we going to have some reformatting? You know, are we going to have some changes in some organizations? Or we need new organizations? Or we need to do away with certain that were existing before, but prove their complete use, use, uselessness, right? So, so that's uh, a lot of things we've learned, I think, uh, you know, through the times of this uh, war. And... Uh, I'll probably stop here because you know uh, I, I, I'm prone to this long monologue, but, <laughs> but but well, I guess it comes with our profession sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> you can just talk and talk and talk, but at some point of time you need to stop. So thank you for your attention so far, and I'm looking forward to your questions and remarks and comments. Thank, thank you, you yeah. so much. Such a rich and wide-ranging set of points. I was scrolling notes constantly. Okay. Yeah. Um, before we go on, I realized that just after you started speaking, I completely forgot in my rush to, in excitement to hear you speak, I forgot to get, give an acknowledgement that um, we're all gathered here as guests on the land of the Musqueam people, right. the unceded ancestral traditional lands of the Musqueam people. And I think it's, it's highly relevant to this topic. That's right. Um, to think That's about right. displacement and yeah. colonialism. Yeah, I even didn't mention imperialism and colonialism. Right. That's yeah. another lens you can see this war through. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay, let's open it up for questions. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Because uh, yeah. you mentioned a lot of like 
countries, but I see that you don't mention China, so I oh, do. Yeah. I yeah. Like, a mentor. A mentor. Uh, yeah. 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 But I mean, especially because, yeah. you know, I mean, there was this long talk between yeah. Putin and Sure. And if there's anything to look there. Yeah. Well. well, it's a great subject. I meant to mention it, but, uh, you know, yeah, just just so much. I, I, I made it yeah, just so much. Yeah. Well, China Russia relations, China's role in this war is very interesting, and there's a lot of contradictions there. You know, there's a lot of reasons why China might like the war, even, you know, dragging forward and being, being longer uh, and, and, and not like it. You know, for instance, like if you, if you think about why they might like it, is one of the reasons, of course, that, that the US and the West is so involved in helping Ukraine financially and sending weapons. So uh, China is basically thinking, okay, they're distracted from dealing with us, you know. So even though there is actually uh, evidence on the ground that uh, US at least is not wasting any time, they are actually working very actively on Chinese direction as well, uh, putting together various formats and working with allies in the Asian Pacific and trying to contain and deter China there you know, and working with Taiwan and so on. So it's so not necessarily, you know, like it's like some people in the in, in, in US actually, especially some Republicans, some, some senators like Senator Hawley, for instance, George Hawley, who says like, America should focus either on China or Russia. And we should focus on China because it's just a bigger threat to us. You know, and Russia's war against Ukraine is not a direct threat to us. So uh, I, I think it's a false argument because there is a connection, first of all, between you, 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 Russia and China. And on the other hand, as I said, you know, U.S. is still capable, especially if you're dealing with allies, uh, you know, if you're working with allies to deal with both the Russian threat and Chinese challenge. You know, President Biden actually prefers to call it a challenge, mostly when he talks about China. It's not a threat. <laughs> right. So, so, uh, so that what they might like, uh, you know, but what they don't like is that Russia clearly showing its weakness. Uh, and it's a major ally, and China was kind of thinking, okay, that's a good ally that we have now. Well, it's not such a strong ally. <laughs> it's clear for them, to them. So, uh, other thing is uh, Putin most probably promised uh, she quick, victorious war when he visited shortly before February 24th. Uh, that's not what's going on. So, Chinese are not happy about that. Uh, they are attached to Russia ideologically in many ways, and I think their reputation has been hit because of that. Uh, definitely in the eyes of Europeans. Uh, Chinese worked diligently for years in, in trying to create a certain type of relations, cooperative relations with Europeans. Uh, now it's damaged, among other things, by Chinese propaganda, ideological kind of PR, support for Russia, and other things. So, so in that particular respect, therefore, uh, I think there was a logic of them not supporting Russia in a major way, like giving a lot of weapons to Russia not crossing the red line. I think this logic still still is there, still stands, you know, but we'll see. Because, of course, in the recent months, we've heard this uh, rumors that Chinese maybe are on the edge of maybe giving Russia more weapons or something like that. It might be the case because they don't want to lose Russia to lose badly. You know, it's still an ally. You know, uh, they don't want to, they, 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 they may want to try to deny the West a victory as well. And therefore, so if the West is giving their guy Ukraine the weapons and financial assistance, so maybe the logic then, for, therefore, for us is to give more assistance to Russia, which is our guy in this fight. So we'll see. You know, of course, in recent, you mentioned visit to 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 Moscow by Xi, but also there was a conversation on the phone uh, by Xi and Zelensky, and where, where Xi, by the way, mentioned that we always been uh, having good relations, actually, and that's true. You know, actually, China has been working with Ukraine a lot. In investing tons of money into Ukraine. I mean, less than in Russia, but a lot of money into Ukraine, Ukrainian economy before the war. So that was kind of regrettable for Chinese that now they have to choose, you know. So it's a situation where you have to choose. You either with Russia or with Ukraine, can be quite neutral. So, of course, if you look at the Chinese propaganda information machine, they're basically repeating Russian narrative and blaming everything on the West, on the NATO, and everything. So. So I think uh, China is in a difficult situation right now, uh, you know, and uh, of course another function that their relations with the U.S. deteriorated in the last few weeks and months. Uh, so they're trying to understand what's the best move for them going forward. But I think there is a lot of logic and a sense in terms of them seeing their interest in this war for them to kind of stay aside. Mm -hmm. Helping Russia with trade, buying energy, maybe delivering some uh, stuff to Russia, which can be 
used for double use, meaning that, you know, you know yeah, a washing machine or TV set, and then you deconstruct it, and you take the semiconductors and chips, and you use it to produce weapons. So, so they can do that kind of stuff. Can they actually deliver more weapons, more sophisticated and bigger numbers? They can. Will they do it? Hopefully not. I mean, of course, that would be a game changer for Ukraine because right now the West is working uh, at the edge of their abilities to help Ukraine because the production cycle of weapons in the West, even like in the US down there, you know, uh, is they're exhausted. They depleted their storages already. You know, they're providing, they're producing 15,000 shells of artillery rounds a month. Ukraine is using something like 5,000 a day. You know, and now rationing, so less of that, but Russia is like much more. So basically, Ukraine is running through US production of shells through in three days, the monthly production of shells in three days. So, you know, and let alone other countries, you know, that we're talking about is the military superpower, you know, the country which is which is, has this colossal military budget and stuff like that. So, yeah, if China involves itself more actively in this uh, war on the Russian side, that would be very unfortunate for Ukraine. I still don't think that would allow Russia to, like, to win the war, you know, you know by, like, knockout, you know, but uh, they, 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 they really lost their momentum, you know, the really long ago, let go, met their culmination moment, as the military experts say, so they couldn't advance right now. No, not really. Yeah. Well, in some time from now, who knows? If Putin does another wave of mobilization and then another, and he can, you know, well, would that actually meet some resistance from a Russian society and some rebellion and some kind of protest, massive protest? I don't know. Uh, you know, but uh, if he does it, that's another several hundred thousand people on the Russian side, and that could also change the situation if they are also uh, armed with like Chinese weapons. But for now, I'm hoping and thinking that maybe they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't cross that red line. Yeah. That's a great question, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I have another question. <laughs> yes, please, of course. Because um, you mentioned that there was like, I mean, obviously Putin is not considering losing or giving up, right? Yeah. And then he will try to yeah. win by any means possible. All right. Do you think this means the nuclear question comes again yeah. on the table? Yeah. And, yeah. and then my other question is sort of related to that. How much do you think Russian, the Russian civilians yeah. will put up with the war? Like, when will it be breaking point for them? Well, on the second question, I don't know. I mean, I'm not an expert in Russia. Mm. Uh, is there a breaking point? You know, I don't know. I mean, Putin's been constructing the current Russian society, you know, the political model over the years and years. Uh, he really, uh, you know, he really made this country uh, in the way that he wanted to. So. Uh, and sometimes in my talks I mentioned that the Nazis were in power in Germany only for 12 years and Putin has already doubles, doubled that time. So, and he never wasted any time. And, and, and therefore people brainwashed, the propaganda is there, they're talking now about their West out there to destroy us and do away with Russia. So it's basically a fair fight for us, it's an existential fight, it's a narrative for another patriotic war, so we can't, you know, we can't really lose it. Uh, it's going to be end of Russia as we know it, and a lot of people were buying this, unfortunately, within Russia. So I don't know, is there any breaking point there? You know, how many coffins should Russian soldiers should come back home? You know, apparently not too many coming to places like Moscow and Saint Petersburg, Saint Petersburg you know, mostly to other places in Russia. So that's another thing. You know, I don't know. So, but uh, the first question on the nuclear thing, uh, nuclear option was never off the table. You know, and it remains on the table. So one thing we can say prudently enough is that uh, we shouldn't discard theoretically that it might be used the nuclear weapon, you know. And of course, Russians are always willing to remind us that they have this, uh, you know, card <laughs> in their hands; they can use it. So on the other hand, of course, uh, there's been a lot of debate about this: will Russia actually maybe doing it or not? And most people came to conclusion that probably not for various reasons, like one of those reasons is just a military, uh, what's the right word here, the sense to do it in the military terms that wouldn't give them the win in the war. Necessarily, they use some tactical nuclear weapons on Ukrainian troops. Ukraine would continue to fight. So, uh, you know, so it's not like, you know, okay, you can use a nuke and it's like August of 1945 and then Japan capitulates and surrenders. So it's different. 
Uh, other thing is that uh, he's gonna really be cutting all of his sympathy and ties with uh, people in, like in Global South and countries like China and India who deliver public notices and warnings to him not to do it, not to go there. You know, and uh, so he will be completely isolated. Right now he, Putin, I mean, he is isolated kind of, but there are also still a lot of countries out there that are maybe sympathetic or neutral or ignorant about the war. So for whatever reasons, uh, in, uh, specifically in this, well, not politically correct, but still used term global south. So, and uh, so he's gonna lose that, you know. So for someone, if they use nuclear weapons against Ukraine, for someone to, to, to come out and say, we still support Ukraine, Russia, Russia maybe is doing a good thing, defending their interests, that would be completely impossible. So, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, finally, maybe there is also apparently a plan by NATO countries to actually strike Russian troops in Ukraine with conventional weapons if that happens. You know, I don't know if that's really gonna happen, if that happens, so let's hope nothing of that happens, right? But uh, the Russians probably believe that's the case, you know, and there have been some uh, communication to Russian leadership in recent months, and I think the Russian military believe that, you know, if not Putin, if not people in Kremlin, but the Russian generals clearly aware of, of NATO and American troops in, in Europe being capable of doing that, you know, and just to lose all of your troops like, like this, in Ukraine, that would be, you know, and what they do in return, that's another thing, that's even scarier, like, you know, how this cycle of, you know, action and retaliation, what they're going to lose, go to, that's going to be nuclear escalation with quotation marks and without quotation marks, so, so let's hope it's not going to go there, but uh, I think there is a logic to believe that he's probably not going to do it, you know, but uh, anything else short of that, he would do it, you know, and that's, that's not, by the way, not just nuclear, it's also they have chemical weapons, biological, but trilogical, it's so basically what WMD, weapons of mass destruction, they can use those too, you know, you know. not to mention, by the way, if they use nuclear, or, you know, that their own troops will be exposed, but, through, but Putin clearly doesn't care about how many his own troops he loses in Ukraine, so, so we'll see, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, why would Putin be doing this? And so, I was thinking about a few things that you were mentioning. Is this the war in general? In general. The... No, it's things you mentioned, like with existentialism, yeah. with McKinder. And so, maybe from a Russian perspective, if you have Ukraine moving towards yeah. Europe, yeah. towards NATO, right. what they're thinking is based on our history, Napoleon, Austro-Hungarian Empire, yeah. German Empire, yeah. Nazis. Right. So on a geostrategic level, yes. also with the buffer zone that right. you have with the Ukraine, Belarus, and so forth, that you know this is protection against yes. an invasion from the West. Yeah. So I mean, this is something within I think the Russian mythology, yeah. right? Yeah. And then with regards to like mythology. I mean, Kiev, isn't that the ninth century? This is the place that the Rus basically inhabited. Yeah. And yeah. for then, now, this no longer to be a part of this Russian mythology, because there's got to be more than just material interest. There's yeah. something like deep set yeah. within the Russian yeah. psyche. Yeah. So I was just wondering if you could speak to that, because when you yeah, mentioned sure. Israel, sure. Like I thought, sure. you know, the existential threat from yeah. Palestinians, yeah. right of return, to, yeah. you know, yeah. liberating them off the face from the river to right. the sea, right. 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 maybe they understood that there's something yeah. here where a resolution is going to be different. Well, I think it's really about history and ideology. Uh, it's, re it's clearly not material interest, uh, like some people would say, even things like, oh, they would want call of Donbass or something. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, they would probably want to have uh, Ukrainian ports on the Black Sea to use it for their economy, or maybe they would like their fertile lands, uh, you know, in the south of Ukraine also to use for their economy, uh, and they are stealing the harvest like like they they do, and they proudly report in their media that uh, actually they are actually their harvest is bigger as, uh, than ever. Well, sure, because you also have you know places like Kherson and the Borysia region now also reporting. Uh, their harvest uh, to Russian economy. So, uh, I think it's about ideologies. I think it's about Putin actually, you know, thinking about symbolism of certain numbers like him turning 70 uh, and about 100 years of Soviet Union's creation. You know, so in 1922 it was happening. 
I think it's about him actually thinking about believing what he writes and says openly about Ukraine not being a state. There is no such country, there's no such people, there's no such culture. It's non-historical, it's artificial creation. You know, you, you mentioned history is not just about Napoleon. He apparently spoke to Polish leader and Hungarian leaders to basically deliver the message like, if we strike and we take whatever is ours in Ukraine, would you be interested in getting whatever <laughs> yours? You know? yes. Yeah, so, so he's in that kind of terms, you know, so he is actually seeing this history and he's talking about Peter the Great as a role model, but, uh, you know, in the practical terms, you know, what happened in 17th, 18th, 19th century, in practical terms, he thinks chimes haven't changed. And people here in the West, like including President Obama, for instance, when he was mentioning when the, the Russian aggression started in 2014, they were saying, well, we live in 21st century, you don't do these things. But Putin says, I do, you know, <laughs> so that's what in my, at my disposal, you know. In Ukraine, is critical to me, it's key, it's instrumental. Whatever great power Russia will want to create without some kind of control over Ukraine, or at least not allowing Ukraine to slip away to the West from Russian sphere of influence, that's not going to happen. So therefore, Ukraine is absolutely key, if at all, you know, more important than many other regions within Russia itself, right? Mm -hmm. So therefore, I need to do it. I need to do it. Uh, you know, it's our time. Ukraine is moving slowly towards the West. If I don't do it now, within five to 10 years, it's going to be even more difficult for us. You know, and uh, Ukraine is really disappointing. I was hoping, Putin thinking, right, that this Zelensky guy, being a novice, a rookie, a dilettante, you know, and saying things like, you know, pro, you know, Russian speaking Jew, uh, you know, and, and saying things like we wouldn't shoot, we'll come and we'll find a common language, you know, with, with Putin, we'll, we'll solve this all. And then all of a sudden, uh, a certain period of time, he is even worse than Poroshenko, you know, actually Putin hates Poroshenko much less than he hates Zelensky, all right? So all this, you know, is really in his mind and also isolated and also feared for, for his life, maybe for his skull conditions, I don't know, I'm not gonna speculate, but COVID was a factor clearly and him definitely distancing all of these people who, who would be able to say no or say something contrary to what he thinks needs to be done and surrounding himself completely with people thinking in sync with him, you know, and yes, man, you know, so all that taking together, I think, I think it's, it's actually what pushed him. Not to, not to forget that he thought that he's gonna really, you know, really prevail quickly, you know, yeah, that Ukraine wouldn't fight. You know, he was thinking in a, in a uh, what's the word, uh, in a sense, uh, I'm still forgetting the right word, but he was thinking through the prism of the pattern of what happened 2015, 2014, when Ukraine is quickly defeated and near Yelovaisk and then the Baltsova. You know, a very small amount of Russian troops actually went in at, at decisive points and that helped to defeat whatever Ukrainian troops were there. But Ukraine really evolved in this eight years since 2014 or 2015, including its military forces, you know, and uh, he didn't notice that. You know. Actually for them, you know, for Russians paying so much attention to Ukraine as, as they need to control Ukraine, they've been not paying at all attention to what's happening in Ukraine, mm -hmm. what's happening in terms of within Ukraine, domestic development, economic, social, ideological, completely ignorant. You know, they basically think they are like us, you know. And uh, that's, that's it, you know. Like for instance, with their striking of missiles against the energy infrastructure and power stations, apparently someone in Kremlin came up with that plan. And, and the logic of the plan, the rationale for the plan was like, Ukraine is gonna suffer in the winter without heating and everything and electricity, and they're gonna out in the street and gonna protest, and they're gonna demand Zelensky signing a peace treaty with Russia. So if that is the case, that's showing us again and again that they can't learn even, you know, like, like from early mistakes of this war. You know, they are completely, uh, you know, getting Ukrainians wrong. <laughs> so that Ukrainians are gonna do that. On the contrary, it actually made a lot of people who were still maybe in Ukraine, you know, sitting in the fence, completely antagonistic to Russia, of course for putting them through the suffering, but not in the sense of like Zelensky need to sign some kind of peace treaty right away. So I guess it's, it's really a combination of factors. So, so whenever someone says there is one thing that pushed Putin and tipped him across the line to do this massive invasion, I say no, it's a long list of things. You know, it's a really long list of factors 
you know, which one was of them decisive? Maybe one of them was decisive, but we don't know. It's very non-transparent regime. It's very Byzantine, of course, as we know. So we don't know enough, you know, about was there one thing that kind of made him say, okay, that's enough. We're going to invade. Yeah. Yeah. This is a follow-up. Yeah. Question, right? Because I mentioned his uh, history, ideology that also can be seen as almost an embellishment, to the, something more maybe central. If we can do that, guess or I just going into power, right? Yeah. And having power yeah. and having that interest yeah. in, in and over calculation, right? And seeing yeah. Ukraine as a kind of more smooth most yeah. booster, yeah. right? And most appropriate and most suitable and yeah. most impactful as yeah. well. But then that leads me to that question about misunderstanding of Putin. But Putin I guess it's just a stand in for something much larger, right? He's yeah. just one person, but there is yeah. no establishing that almost created him. Yeah. All those people are no yeah. longer around, yeah. most of them. But it's like a golem, like he just kind of got out of the hole, right? And he has yeah. his own, own, own life, but then there is more to that. So there is this misunderstanding of Putin, mm. because he was talking about the lessons, and from, for the West, right, that was a probably a huge wake up. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a, that you, do you see some residual misunderstandings of Putin and also of Ukraine in mm -hmm. the West? Mm. Well, first of all, I need. I think you need to patent this Putin as a golem concept. Yeah. You know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's excellent. That's actually excellent. You know, yeah. Created by the system, kind of came out of the system and got got out of control and and, 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 and earned his own like life cycle or something. Yeah, that's fascinating. So, uh, I don't know. I think that he really. He really believed that he can achieve something here and uh, the West wouldn't be able to stop him. That's another thing, but what kind of messages the West has sent to Putin over years? Mm -hmm. You know, 2008, I mentioned already, you know, war against Georgia, what happens then, turning completely the blind eye to what Russia did in Georgia. You know, NATO is working with Russia because they need a northern distribution network to get to Afghanistan. You know, US is actually new administration come into place and they announced reset policies with Russia. So he said, okay, fine, you know, I got away with that. So, you know, maybe I can do something more. You know, 2015, there is Syria, there is Red Line. You know, Obama is saying that if, uh, you know, Assad uses chemical weapons on his own people, there's going to be a Red Line, we're going to just do something militarily and then doesn't do anything, you know, so, so and other things, you know, so basically tons of uh, signals, like since 2014, some sanctions, yes. But not nothing substantial for Russian economy to, to go to go down, right? Not to mention even that the most harshest sanctions actually in 2014 were announced on Russia, not when Russia moved in and took away Crimea, but in the summer of 2014 when Russians downed the Malaysian airliner, all right? So Malaysian Air MH17. So that is also quite a telling, you know. So okay, Putin thinks. You know, when I go and take Crimea away from Ukraine, okay, there are some sanctions, but not a big deal. But when I actually down an airliner, which is full of like, people like Dutch and Australians, they actually care about it. So, so, okay, I can actually do more things to Ukraine and being more careful not crossing the border and doing something hostile to the West. And then the West would be like, okay, he's doing something within this sphere of influence, uh, within what Russians call the sphere of privileged interest, uh, which is Ukraine. And they wouldn't mind, you know, even Obama, you know, uh, in his one of the final interviews, the famous interview, for, which was called Obama Doctrine for Atlantic Monthly, he said, there are red lines, there's not too much we can do to help Ukraine. Russia can do more to conquer Ukraine because they're close, they're invested. You know, we're not so invested in the future of Ukraine. I, don't, I mean, uh, you know, it's a quite a frank interview, quite actually interesting because he was still president of Ukraine, of US. When he gave that interview, but it's telling you what a lot of people in the U.S. thought, and 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 in Moscow they're paying attention to all of it. You know, they're really paying attention to all of it, and they thought that okay, it's going to be like it was before. You know, maybe the coalition they're talking about the coalition, but maybe there'll be no coalition. The sanctions will be not serious for us. The weapons supply, look, we've got so much weapons here on our side. How much weapon they can give to Ukraine before they actually deliver it to Ukraine? Uh, you know, Ukraine will be over. We'll actually prevail in this war. I think there is a whole combination of things that uh, misled him in a way. And then there was a rude awakening, and then there was initial failure, and, and struggling, and I think a shock to him. But then again, he regained the composure, you know, and then he thinks that, okay, we probably can wait, 
and be patient. You know, I don't care how much money I spend. I don't care how many Russian soldiers, citizens are going to kill in the war. And therefore, if we're patient enough, you know, Ukraine going to be, you know, you know, destroyed, ruined. Uh, you know, Ukrainian military is, is uh, you know, the Ukrainian military is going to be destroyed as well. So many losses on the Ukrainian side as well. And the West going to lose their patience, you know. So I think he's doubling down and he's still hoping that he can regain initiative in this war. Yeah. I don't know if that is an answer to what you, yeah, yeah. Okay, partially, good. Partially is good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you would say no completely, you completely missed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Right? For yeah. quite, quite a long time, being invited and being treated well, we just yeah. have to talk to him, right? Yeah. Oh, oh, that respect. Yeah, of course, of course. Macron over the long yeah. table and so yeah, on. Yeah, look at the means process, for instance. The means process, like, okay, yeah. It, it wasn't seen for eight years as something which is absolutely urgent for the West to solve. You know, it's a little war in Donbass, okay, we can live with that. Unless there is a big war, you know, then, of course, we need to do something. So. No, now we, even Germans, I mean, I must understand that we need to do something, <laughs> which, uh, you know, which we didn't do in, in those eight years. So in that particular respect, yes, he was doing this little thing slowly, incrementally, you know, and even uh, with, Obama, with the Biden administration, like days before February 24th, when he made this famous, uh, famously misspoke at the press conference in the White House, like he said, we don't know how we're going to react. If it's a minor incursion, it's one kind of reaction. If it's a bigger incur, you know, like, and people got critical of him immediately, and he walked it back, and he explained, like, and there is a logic in what he said. Yes, if Russia does something in Donbass and tries to get a couple of new towns in Donbass, you know, that's one kind of scale of reaction. You know, if Russia actually goes full scale into Ukraine, that's a different type of reaction from the West and US, of course. So that's what he meant. But he, he sounded like he wouldn't mind a little, a little minor incursion of Russia into Ukraine. So yeah, I guess uh, I guess uh, there was some kind of a spell on energy in Europe for sure, you know. So like Merkel insisting all the time that uh, what Russia is doing to Ukraine is wrong, but what we're doing in energy supply with Nord Streams from Russia is different. Yeah. There's no connection, she said, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what do you mean no connection? <laughs> that's how Putin lives. That's how Putin's Russia lives. That's what they live off. You know, they're selling this stuff to you guys. And they fund it. And they also so many, you know, spare parts and Russian weapons produced by Siemens and others, you know. So, you know, that's completely irrelevant. I mean, uh, irres irresponsible position. And she's still doubling down. She says, I haven't made any mistakes, you know. You know, including preventing Russia, Ukraine getting membership action plan to go to NATO, you know, back in 2008 at Bucharest NATO summit and other things and, and not being harsher on Putin in the previous year, so, yeah. So, you're right, you know, that's another good expression like that uh, he had uh, under his spell, the West mm -hmm. under his spell, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I just had a small question. Okay. On your, what do you think of the uh, argument that Putin kind of uses this also as a means of garnering legitimacy? So, there's yeah. a talk about, yeah. you know, low public support, yeah. you know, failing economy after right. COVID, things like that, and yeah. this is an opportunity for him to really yeah. And support because I just think with the ideology argument, what would be the yeah. like explanation? Like why 2022 and not 2014? You know why stop at Crimea and yeah. border skirmishes rather yeah. than you know finish yeah. the job then? Yeah. So I just want. Yeah, to... there are many interesting things in your question. So first of all, in 2014, uh, many people believe that Russia was unable to do what it's done in 2022 and 2014. That's one thing. Uh, other thing in t about 2014 and 2022, if you compare them was that Putin thought that having Crimea under their control and part of Donbass under their control, de facto control, would be enough to prevent Ukraine from going to NATO, from prevent actually the westward drive, you know, the, the drift actually of Ukraine towards the west. So, yeah, towards the west. So uh, that would be enough. You know, you destabilize Ukraine via Donbass, you do the Minsk process, uh, you know, you to kind of try to make this as constant kind of wound in Ukraine, Donbass, and you destabilize Ukraine. Ukraine pays too much money to for the war effort in Donbass, you know, and uh, and things like that. So uh, that was probably enough. And at some point of time, he thought that well, it's not working, you know. So basically, basically, what uh, the the evolution is very clear of Russian policy towards Ukraine. Prior to 2014, there's completely soft power. So with energy, trade, working with political forces in Ukraine, information space, and so on. Since 2014, it's hybrid, you know, with war plus soft. 
And since 2022, it's, it's completely hard power. So right now, they don't care about the Russian war concept anymore. You know, they understand they're actually destroying it by their own missiles and, and shelling of cities in the east and the south, where they actually have this ethnic Russians and Russian speakers. So therefore, he's completely switching to this, like, let's conquer Ukraine. Let's use it, whatever we have in military, in our military, let's just use this because soft power is not working. So I, I guess that's, that's the main change there. In terms of... Um, domestic factors how they drove him maybe to this decision i don't think so but again i'm not an expert on russian domestic politics uh he might have thought that if it's a little victorious and short war like we had in 2014 that would be a great thing because of course in 2014 we saw after crimea that his ratings went high really high quickly you know so he wouldn't mind that you know but uh, was it a decisive consideration for him i don't think so I think he was quite comfortable in his position and he was in control and he's still in control. I actually belong to those who believe that if they lose this war, it doesn't mean that he's necessarily going to lose the power or, who sh or should just uh, release the power to someone else. I think he's going to be continuing in control. Also in terms of narrative or whatever happens in that war, even if Russia kind of loses the war, in terms of working with domestic audience, he'll be completely capable of explaining we actually won. You know, so like, for instance, do you see American and Ukrainian tanks in the streets of Moscow? No. So we were up against the entire NATO plus Ukraine and we haven't lost. Isn't that a victory? So, I mean, it all depends on definition in terms of how he's seen by international community and other players in the world. That's what he worries about, that he loses, that he's been humiliated, that he hasn't achieved something which we wanted to achieve. You know, that that's what he worries about. But in terms of like his domestic context, you know, I don't, I don't think anyone's really capable of threatening his power right now. He created the system, he's at the top. I mean, I don't know, history teaches us that, that it's possible that even such type of systems can crumble really quickly. But I don't think that's a case. In, I mean, I hope it might be the case, but I don't think it's a case in the case of Putin's Russia. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah, well, maybe question. it was one. Yeah, yeah. Just in, internally, discussions in Ukraine pre 2022, if you could tell yeah. us something about Germany energy policy. Yeah. Are you from Germany? No. no. Okay, all right. Partially. Partially. <laughs> partially. partially. Again, partially. So, yeah. partially is, a, is your favorite word. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. So, yeah, uh, Ukrainians were not happy about this Nord Stream situation. And not happy with Biden administration deciding not to apply sanctions against Germany. Uh, that was the most acute political question, the issue being discussed in Ukraine in 2021. I personally thought back then that Ukrainian leadership is paying way too much attention to this issue and damaging relations with both Germany and US, insisting that the sanctions should be applied. You know, because, of course, the Nord Stream working. It's not something that we're going to see, what we want to like in Ukraine, of course, right? So we would want it to stop, you know, in the Nord Stream 2 not to be built, not to be functioning. So of course, yes, but not to the extent that if you are Zelensky, if you're making these harsh statements about Biden the responsible, make a historical mistake, and he said those words back in 2021, you know, that you're kind of jeopardizing your relations with Washington, which is an important partner for, for you in dealing with Russia after all, and Germany too, you know, so Germany is an important partner, allies we now see for Ukraine as well. So, so Ukrainians were not happy about it, but well, it happened. So the war stopped Nord Stream anyway. Other mistakes that he probably made, Zelensky in the months coming up to aggression, well, downplaying the possibility of aggression, you know, you know and not heeding, not heeding the warnings from Washington. You know, he thought that maybe he knows better, you know, some several lines of defense that he's now using at his circle Zelensky, I mean, in terms of explaining what he was doing in those months prior to February 21st. One is like, okay, we've seen these congregations of Russian troops on our borders before, so we know better. The Westerners don't. You know, Americans, other thing, Americans haven't quite shared a lot of intelligence with Ukrainian leadership until basically like the last few days and weeks before the massive aggression. And even with European, key European allies. So key European allies not seeing American intelligence. They were communicating to Kiev, don't listen to Americans. Americans are overreacting. They are alarmists. They, they, there is no way it's going to be this massive invasion. So Zelensky was kind of, OK. And Zelensky, we need to remember, he was traumatized deeply by the, the Trump's pressure 
on him in 2019. He just became a president of Ukraine, and what he saw, what he saw, the first thing, you know, from mm -hmm. from America is this incredible, unprecedented pressure by president of the United States, you know, to deliver certain things for his domestic political benefit, you know, and then learn, Zelensky learned, he was traumatized, he, was, he learned that Americans can play tricks and, and, and dirty games with Ukraine, that Americans are not always having Ukraine's interests close to their heart, so, and that's created distrust, like a mistrust, really, the lack of trust between Washington and Kiev, and some echoing moments of it, you, you still see lingering, actually, in bilateral relations, even now, when America supplied so much assistance and everything, and so much involved with war effort. So, uh, yeah, how's that happening? How's that possible? Don't play angrily American warnings about imminent aggression and saying that, oh, I don't want to, I, don't, I didn't want to panic. That would be bad for the Ukrainian economy. Well, but the massive Russian aggression is even worse for the Ukrainian economy, so, so I'm sorry. You know, why didn't you practice, you know, just for the sake of like, maybe Americans are right. Why don't you put in place a certain, you know, program of uh, preparing the, the population, for instance, if there is a need for evacuation, what do they do? Where people go, you know, if there is a strike or something in their city? Nothing of that sort was done. And that's responsible, okay? Like, what happened in Kherson, for instance? Who, who did that? You know, what kind of treason? Like, how, how the president allowed this kind of betrayal on the local level that the Russian troops rolled in without basically any, any, any resistance there in the south? You know, and the one, the only major bridge there in Changar which were the Ukrainians practiced for years, you know, and it was mined and it had to be exploded. Like the second Russian troops would have approached the bridge, was actually demined and explosives were removed and the bridge wasn't destroyed. That wouldn't stop completely the Russian invasion, but that would make a lot of problems for Russian logistically just to move into Ukraine. And maybe Ukrainian troops would have more time to move around there and organize some resistance. It didn't happen. Why? Ukrainians are still wondering, you know, I need to be frank with you. And I, and I mentioned these issues when I talk in other audiences as well. So it's not, it's not completely like, completely very smart kind of wartime leader. So, you know, he's responsible. He's a, you know, he is, he's a leader of the country. They you know. destroyed when they destroyed the Russians. Antonovsky bridge was Who destroyed the bridge? The, the Russians, when they withdrew from uh, Kherson. No, that's a different bridge. That's a different bridge. That's a bridge which is connecting Kherson region to Crimea. So it's not, it's not the one, it's not the bridge in, in Kherson across the Dnieper River, no, yeah. So, and say in the north, you know, again, Russian troops, massive number in Belarus, you know, no preparation of defending Kyiv, mostly believing that Russians would probably do something in Donbass. So again, people wondering, like Western journalists traveling in the last days before invasion, between the border back to Kyiv and saying, no trenches, no Ukrainian troops, no one preparing any, any defense line. So therefore, of course, Russians rolled to the suburbs of Kyiv within hours. You know, is that responsible? It is responsible. So after all, some measures been taken by Ukrainian military in the last moment. And that's still an open question for us. Like, was it actually ordered by Zelensky for them to do? Or was it something that was done by military commanders even without president being aware of that? Like spreading some units, moving some in the last moment, clearly the Air Force of Ukraine, you know, moved to the backup airfields at the last moment, and so that's completely intact. So the Russian strikes at the airports uh, didn't deliver any positive results for them because the Ukrainian Air Force already moved out of those main, main airports. So, so clearly Ukrainian military was maybe like hearing what Americans were saying, you know, but uh, not enough. Yeah. So, yeah, I didn't want to create this impression that we have this guru, super wise kind of leader in, char in charge of Ukraine. Not to mention that right now Ukrainians actually uh, wonder, like, uh, you know, would he use martial law uh, powers, you know, maybe to, you know, just to stay in power longer, maybe undo elections in the coming year because the elections are due next year. Yes. You know, so what if this war actually becomes less intensive and uh, not that large scale, you know, but would he keep martial law in place, which would allow him not to do elections next year? Mm -hmm. What's going to happen to his ratings if he sits down and he has to sign up some some kind of peace treaty with Russia eventually, which would, could be the case? Mm -hmm. You know, right now they're sky high, these ratings, but that would be detrimental and very difficult for him. So he's very in a difficult, difficult situation right now, politically. Because unlike Putin, who is sitting there in a the cloud and makes all decisions for this big country, you know, mm -hmm. Zelensky actually 
uh, he's functioning in different political environment. You know, it's not political vacuum. He has parliament, he has a position, a position being very silent, you know, trying not to attack him too much. But the moment he does something like sign the peace agreement with Russia, for instance, allowing some Ukrainian territories still under Russian control, no, believe me, people like Poroshenko, Timoshenko, and others who are very experienced political players, they would jump on him like crazy. So, and uh, that would be a difficult moment. And Russia is probably hoping for that moment in Ukraine because historically, even you know, Ukraine has been weakest when we're divided domestically. And that would be probably a good point to to <laughs> conclude. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah, you yeah. So much.